Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I'm gonna walk you through the process of valuing SoFi stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 7.9 billion market cap. They're trading at 7.47 a share, Boeing 7.47, and they have 1.1 billion shares outstanding. SoFi is a fintech company that operates in the US, Latin America, and Canada. So they cover North America. It has three segments, lending, technology, and financial services. If you want a personal loan from SoFi, you can get one. You can also get a student loan, a home loan, etc. They also have an investing platform that provides access to trading and advisory solutions. You can get a SoFi credit card that offers cash back, they have insurance as well. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Negative free cash flow every single year. It is hard to look at free cash flow for a banking company. Net income is probably a better indicator. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's also negative every single year. Their revenue is still pretty low. It was under 1 billion in 2021. It more than doubled by 2023 to 2.1 billion, up a little in the trailing 12 months to 2.2 billion. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 20 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $17 billion. We divide that by 1.1 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $16. They're trading at $8, so they're trading at a 50% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. The future free cash flows are based on analyst estimates. And I think they're getting closer to profitability. Once they hit three billion in revenue, I think that's their break even point. There are 52 companies in the same industry as SoFi and if they have a number in red, they're worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. They spend 129 million in CapEx. These are the investments in property, plant, and equipment. Software is also capitalized, certain software. A good debt to equity ratio for every dollar of equity, they have 50 cents of debt. They do not pay a dividend. One main pays the largest dividend, 7.8%. Most companies in this industry pay a dividend. A big negative and free cash flow. You have the big credit card companies, Visa, MasterCard, and Amex. They generate a ton of free cash flow. Amex is the most at 23 billion. It looks like they rank ninth in market cap. They should actually be higher than 12th which is higher than the median, a lot lower than the average. The average is so high because of these top two companies. These top two average 500 billion. Price to book is equal to the median. They're trading at one times book value. We can't look at their PE or price to free cash flow. It's negative. Price to sales is equal to the average. They're trading at 3.6 times revenue. They generate 2.2 billion of revenue between the median and average and they have not been public that long, so we can't look at their five-year annual revenue growth rate. If you put $10,000 into this company when they started trading, you would not be happy at $6,100 today, a 39% loss. Something has to give, because I invested in New Bank, New Holdings, the Brazilian FinTech, and I'm up 225% on that investment. I dropped about 25K into New Bank in June 2022, right in the beginning of this chart and it's up 223%. In that same time frame, this stock is up 22%. They're really similar companies. I wonder why SoFi is not doing nearly as well as NewBank. NewBank is much larger. I think NewBank is like 60 billion market cap, like eight times the size of this company. Most of NewBank's customers are in South America. They're located in Brazil, which is where their main customer base is but they have customers in Chile, Argentina, etc. Let's look at their 10Q from the first quarter of 2024. I always start off with the income statement. Their income is from the interest spread, the interest they receive on their loans, 666 million. That's just for the first quarter. Last year, it was 372 million. 57 million from loan origination fees, 7 million from servicing fees, and they also get fees from their platform they offer financial services, 86 million. Other income is 93 million. So total non-interest income, 240 million. 
net interest income is the interest they receive on their loans minus the interest they pay on the debt. So that's 403 million. Net interest income plus non-interest income gives us their total net revenue, 645 million. They also have non-interest expenses like payroll and the cost for running their business, 550 million. So their net income is 88 million. The main way banks and financial institutions make money is the interest spread. When they provide a loan to someone, that's an asset for the bank. They lent out $23.5 billion and are charging 10.57% interest. They also earn interest from investing. So the interest they earn from the $27.4 billion is 9.76%. The interest they pay for getting those funds is 4.4%. So their profit is 5.9%, the difference between these two numbers, the 9.76% and the 4.4%. So the interest they receive on the loans, 666 million. The interest they pay on their debt, 263 million. That's their profit, 402 million. When you deposit money in the bank, that's a liability for this company. So they pay 1.8% on demand deposits, 4.56% on savings deposits. I guess you could think of demand deposits as checking accounts. Time deposits, like a CD, they pay 5% on. They also have warehouse facilities. That's the highest, 6.55%. A warehouse facility is a line of credit. So SoFi can tap into this line of credit anytime they need funds to loan out. It's the most expensive line though, so they rather use other types of lending. Other debt is 1.8 billion, but they only pay 3% on that. They footnote it down here. Interest expense on other debt includes debt issuance and debt discount as well as interest expense on a revolving credit facility. So other debt also includes a revolving credit facility. Banks love when you leave money in a checking account because they don't have to pay you much interest and they get to loan that money out for a lot higher interest. They offer pretty good rates, savings accounts, four and a half percent. But I think rates are gonna come down in another couple of years, they'll be back down to below 1%. Let's go back to the income statement. So they do have positive net income. Last year they had a net loss of 34 million now it's positive 88 million. And they still need funding, so they're adding shares. Last year, 929 million. Now it's 983 million. But once they become profitable consistently, maybe they'll buy back stock. Let's look at a statement of cash flows. They had positive operating cash flow of 738 million. Last year, it was negative 2.2 billion. It was mainly from loaning out so much money last year. They loaned out 2.3 billion. You can see that here, change in loans held for sale. In their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 1.3 billion, 1 billion from a change in loans held for investment. In their financing section, they had a cash inflow of 1 billion. Last year, a cash inflow of 3.4 billion. They had a cash inflow of 3 billion from a net change in deposits, a cash outflow of 2.4 billion. That's from their debt facilities. They added 845 million of debt. They repaid 170 million of debt. So it can be a little tricky looking at the financials for a bank or insurance company. It's not as straightforward as a manufacturing company. Let's take a look at their first quarter presentation slides. I feel the most important indicator for a company is number of members or subscribers or users. When I see Netflix closing in on 300 million subscribers, I know that's a big victory for the company. Because say you had a business where you charged a monthly fee for your service. Say you had 1,000 members and you're not profitable. I know at some point you will be profitable if you keep growing your member base. So if I was to look at a business and I see their membership growing year after year, that's a really positive sign and I'm much more likely to invest in them than if membership was flat or even declining. In the first quarter of 2020, they had 1 million members. One year later, they more than doubled the 2.3 million, 110% growth. A year later, closing in on 4 million, 70% growth. A year after that, 5.7 million, a 46% growth. Now in the first quarter of 2024, 8.1 million, a growth of 44%. As you get bigger, it's harder to grow at triple digit rates. I still view a growth of 44% as a big win. They went from 1 million to 8 million in just four years. They did have a net loss for most of these time periods, but they're sacrificing profit for revenue growth. And a lot of companies do that, and at some point, 
growth will be exponential when they hit their break even point. You can also see new members at the bottom of this list. Even though the growth was only 44% in the first quarter, they had over 600,000 new members. More than any other quarter, except the third quarter of 2023, they added 700,000. It's their second largest quarter in terms of new members added. These kind of stats get me excited to invest in the company. I have not invested in them yet, but I am considering it. They mention it right here on top, 622,000 new members in Q1, bringing our total to over 8 million. If you're one of these members and you got a loan from SoFi, then you're just using one of their products. But if you have a loan and a savings account, you have two products. Now we can see how many products their members are using. 12 million products, 8 million members, so each member uses 1.5 products. Some members use five products. They might have a checking, saving, CD, a loan, insurance. Some members use one product, but the average is 1.5. Product growth went from 1.4 million in Q1 2020, way up to 12 million. In terms of number of new products, this quarter was their biggest ever, except for the third quarter of 2023. Some of the new member growth is from acquisitions. Also new product growth is also from acquisitions. In 2020, they acquired Galileo. So that was a big growth factor for the company. We'll probably talk more about that later when we get to that slide. Ironically, it's the next slide. I didn't even realize that. SoFi acquired Galileo in 2020. This company is a payment processor. They offer things like buy now, pay later, and they have a lot of members, a lot more than SoFi. It was 30 million in Q1 2020, and they grew that 400% to 151 million currently. So that's a nice growth year after year. Galileo is based in Salt Lake City, Utah. SoFi paid 1.2 billion in stock and cash for the company. You could think of Galileo like PayPal, just a lot smaller. Galileo works with a lot of companies, not just this company. They work with h and Block, Robinhood. That's just to name a couple, but they work with a lot more. The core of most banks is lending. They have 1.7 million loans outstanding, and you can see that grows each quarter. It nearly doubled from Q1 2021. It's a pretty consistent growth in the low to mid 20% each quarter. Financial services products, like savings accounts or CDs, that went from 2.2 million to 10.1 million. That's grown a lot more. If they can continue growing organically and through acquisition, the stock could easily 2, 3, 4, 5x. I could see a 10, 20xing. It seems really cheap at this point. Their quarterly revenue was 322 million in Q1 2022, and now it's 581 million. It does go up each quarter, except the most recent quarter. Because Q4 is bigger due to the holidays, but as long as they're growing year over year, they grew 26% when you compare Q1 23 to Q1 24. And I think about two thirds of their revenue is from the interest margin, the interest spread, and about one third is from fees, like loan origination fees and regular banking fees. EBITDA is positive. It was really small in Q1 22, only 9 million. It peaked last quarter, 181 million, but it's still up 25% in Q1 2024, 144 million. Their Q1 revenue guidance was between 550 and 560 million, and they beat that. They had 581 million. Same thing with EBITDA, it was between 110 and 120 million. They reported 144 million. And they crushed gap net income. The guidance was 10 to 20 million they actually got 88 million. Now here's the guidance for Q2 2024. Most companies release earnings about six weeks after quarter close. So six weeks after 6.30 is mid-August. So we have a few more weeks until they release second quarter earnings. But here's the guidance. Revenue 555 million, 565 million, a growth of 15%. Adjusted EBITDA guidance 120 million, gap net income 7.5 million. I'm just taking the middle. I think they'll easily beat gap net income, but I'm more concerned about revenue growth. As long as they keep hitting the revenue targets, I think that'll move the stock. Investors aren't too concerned about net income at this point, it's still gonna be pretty low. As long as they hit their revenue targets, net income will follow. It tends to lag for a while. 
But once economies of scale set in and they pass their break even point, then the growth just stopped being exponential. Full year 2024 guidance, they expect net revenue to be 75% higher than 2023. Tech platform net revenue, 20% higher. Lending net revenue, nearly 100% higher. And the reason it's so much higher is because interest rates are a lot higher. 170 million of gap net income in 2024, 600 million of adjusted EBITDA. A really important number to look at for banks is book value or tangible book value. Tangible book value is assets minus liabilities, excluding intangible assets like goodwill. Total capital ratio of 16%, that's available capital for what a bank has on hand versus risk-weighted assets. Their main asset are the loans. So you have to weigh the risk of those assets, probability of default, the interest rate, things like that. The purpose of this ratio is to identify if a bank has enough funds to cover its losses. 2021 revenue was 1 billion, 2022 1.5 billion, 2023 2 billion. So 2024, they're expecting 2.4 billion. The prior guidance was a little under 2.4 billion. So they actually revised guidance up. Theoretically, a company can revise guidance each quarter. If they revise it down, the stock usually goes down. If they revise it up, the stock goes up. Say for instance, they reported 3 billion of revenue guidance for 2024. The stock would go through the roof. It would probably triple. But if 2024 ended and they totally whiffed, they missed their guidance, the stock will come crashing down, probably even lower than pre-guidance levels. Look at their EBITDA growth from 30 million to 140 million to 400 million. The guidance is close to 600 million and they revised that up also. It was 585 million. They had negative net income every single year, but we saw it was positive for the first quarter. Here, it's right here, net income for the first quarter, 88 million. The first quarter they had positive net income was the fourth quarter of 2023, 38 million. And then it more than doubled to 78 million in the first quarter of 2024. If they average 80 million of quarterly revenue, that's 320 million for the year. Their guidance is half that, 170 million. So as long as they hit their goals, their guidance, the stock should do well. Let's learn about the history of the company. SoFi is short for social finance. It was founded in 2011 by four students who met at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. The founders hoped SoFi could provide more affordable options for taking on debt to fund their education. Their first loan program was a pilot at Stanford. 40 alumni loaned $2 million to 100 students. That's an average of $20,000 per student. In 2012, the company raised $77 million from baseline ventures with participation from DCM and RenRen. Baseline Ventures is a venture capital firm. They were an early investor in Instagram and Twitter. They're one of the most successful venture capitalists in the world. The founder of Baseline Ventures used to go to school at Stanford. That's how we found out about SoFi. A couple of Stanford students founded Instagram. Another Stanford student founded Stitch Fix. DCM Ventures also invested in early seed rounds. They're based in Silicon Valley. Another early investor in SoFi is Ron Suber. Then the next year in 2013, SoFi raised 500 million in debt and equity. They used that money to fund and refinance student loans. Of the 500 million capital injection, 90 million was from equity, 151 million in debt, and 200 million in bank participations. The remaining capital came from Stanford alumni. As of 2013, SoFi funded $200 million in loans to 2,500 borrowers at 105 schools. In 2013, SoFi announced a deal with Barclays and Morgan Stanley to create a bond backed by peer-to-peer -peer student loans, which created the first securitization of these loans to receive a credit rating. In 2014, SoFi raised $80 million in a Series C round led by Discovery Capital Management with participation from Peter Thiel. The money was raised to expand the company's footprint in student loans. In 2015, they announced a $200 million funding round led by Third Point Management. 
Third Point Management is a New York City hedge fund. That company has 16 billion of assets on the management. By 2015, SoFi was offering mortgages in more than 20 states. That's double from their initial launch of 10 states in 2014. By 2015, they funded 2 billion in loans, including student loans, mortgages, personal loans, and MBA loans. In 2015, former SEC chairman Arthur Levitt was added as an advisor. Then they raised $1 billion from SoftBank. SoftBank is Masayoshi Sun giant investment firm. SoftBank invested $20 million in Alibaba when they first started out. That investment turned into $60 billion when the company went public in 2014. You can invest $1 million in 100 companies and all 100 go bankrupt. But just one amazing investment could wipe out all your bad investments. By 2015, they funded $4 billion in loans. In 2016, they became the first startup online lender to receive a AAA rating from Moody's. In 2016, they launched SoFi at Work, an employee benefit program to reduce student debt. As of 2016, they funded more than $12 billion in loans. In 2017, Social Finance Inc, aka SoFi, raised an additional $500 million from an investor group led by Silver Lake. It also included SoftBank. Silver Lake is one of the largest private equity firms in the world. They were an early investor in Expedia, Airbnb, Twitter, and of course SoFi. In 2017, CEO Mike Cagney resigned due to allegations of sexual harassment and skirting risk and compliance controls. In 2018, Anthony Noto resigned as COO of Twitter to become CEO of SoFi. In 2018, SoFi agreed to stop making false claims about savings from student loan refinancing. In 2019, they closed a $500 million round led by Qatar Investment Authority. Qatar is a sovereign wealth fund it was founded by the state of Qatar to strengthen the country's economy. It has about a half a trillion of assets under management. Qatar borders UAE and Saudi Arabia. In 2019, SoFi signed a $20 million deal with the LA Rams and the LA Chargers to rename their stadium SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California. In April 2020, SoFi acquired Galileo for $1.2 billion in stock and cash. In mid-2021, SoFi went public via SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company. They raised $2.4 billion at a $9 billion valuation. A real big milestone for the company is when they received approval to become a national bank charter. If you get a national bank charter, it allows your company to perform core banking activities, such as taking in deposits, and also lending to customers. Because when you don't have that charter, you have to follow each individual state rules. But when you have the federal charter, it supersedes everything. When an entity is considered a national bank, it's kind of like the gold standard. Customers have a lot more confidence leaving their money at those banks. In February 2022, SoFi purchased Golden Pacific Bank Corp. That was for 22.3 million. That was the acquisition that allowed them to obtain the bank charter. In March 2022, they acquired Technosys, a cloud-based banking system for $1.1 billion. In 2023, they were named one of the world's most innovative companies by Fast Company, and also one of the world's top fintech companies by CNBC. By March 2023, they reached $10 billion in total deposits. In that same month, they sued the Biden administration to block the pause on student loan repayment, saying it was hurting their business. SoFi dropped the lawsuit in June 2023 after a debt ceiling deal had been signed into law. In April 2023, they announced they were going to acquire Wyndham Capital Mortgage in an all-cash deal. Wyndham is a mortgage company based in Charlotte, North Carolina. They provide residential mortgage loans through a direct-to-consumer online lending portal. That company is only one of 11 lending tree certified lenders nationwide. SoFi's original business model was an alumni funded lending model that connected students and recent graduates. The investors received a pretty good return and the borrowers received rates lower than the federal government rates. Their focus was minimizing defaults. 
by only taking in low-risk students. Sorry to those philosophy majors who couldn't get a loan. As they expanded their product offerings to include mortgages and personal loans, they moved away from the alumni-funded model, focusing on lending to responsible individuals. Currently, SoFi makes money from each of their divisions. The lending segment, SoFi's largest source of revenue, generates income from net interest, securitization sales, and whole loan sales. The company's technology platform generates revenue from Galileo customer services, including online access and credit card management services. Their other segment, financial services, generates income from transaction and management fees. In 2019, they launched a partnership with Coinbase to offer cryptocurrency trading, offering trading of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and more than 17 other crypto assets. This was available to every state except Hawaii, New Jersey, and West Virginia. In December 2023, they stopped offering cryptocurrency trading. I think that was a smart move. They offer high yield checking and savings accounts with no fees backed by the FDIC. In 2020, they launched a partnership with Samsung Pay. Another interesting product is SoFi Relay. It monitors your credit score and is a budgeting tool and it's available to anyone who has a SoFi account. This service allows users to track their money in the bank on their credit card, all their investments, their loan balances. It also provides weekly credit score updates through TransUnion. Last year, they started to integrate Galileo Financial Technologies AI engine into its personal finance application. They've partnered with several insurance companies such as Lemonade in order to offer life insurance, auto insurance, homeowners insurance, and renters insurance. Let's read some reviews of SoFi. This is for their location in San Francisco, California. Not so great, an average of 2.4 out of 5. Here's a one star. Just a week ago, do not work with SoFi on a HELOC. They are the worst. All in caps. It seems streamlined at first, but then they send you down a rabbit hole of paperwork. They use a third party bank, which makes the process awful because you're dealing with two layers of communication. I am embarrassed I allowed it to go on this long. Sounds pretty severe, like she's in an abusive relationship. Luckily, a friend intervened and introduced me to Guaranteed Rate. That company funded my HELOC in 11 days with a lot less paperwork. I will no longer work with the SoFi. Here's two out of five. I'm just going in order, I'm not cherry picking. I love all the benefits and services they offer, but they lack ability to execute anything. I've been trying to get direct deposit properly set up for five months. I've chatted with support several times and each time they say a ticket has been submitted. Forget the sign up bonus, you'll never get it. Here's a five star they may have paid for this review. I recommend SoFi and will continue to use SoFi for all my financial needs. SoFi is honest, professional, and reliable. SoFi helped me when no one else did. I was in a car accident, falling behind on credit card bills, only able to pay the minimum amount. My interest on these cards went up after COVID. I'm gonna read this verbatim. Thanks to SoFi, I got a low with real, real low interest rate to pay off my high interest credit cards. I can't read this one anymore, let's move on. The next one's two out of five. I called SoFi Home Loans, inquiring about an unresponsive agent. The person who answered the call gave an unrequested opinion about the ridiculousness of our approach to selecting a mortgage. Regardless of whether his view is right or not, it's basic customer experience 101, not to antagonize potential customers in such ways. When I suggested that, his attitude was being rude and our experience with SoFi overall wasn't positive. He invited us to stop the the process, which we are doing as of now. It is a shame, as I have a couple of other products with SoFi, but these interactions have highly downgraded my perception of the company and my willingness to engage again. One out of five, I do not send out reviews on business, even if I had terrible services, but this takes the cake. I disputed an authorized charge on account last week and randomly they froze my account and I only found out because I was trying to pay for my lunch. Ouch, the lunch block. One out of five, I recently had an extremely disappointing experience with SoFi's customer service that compelled me to write this review. 
That's a big word, compelled. The ordeal began when I attempted to open a checking account using a friend's referral link. Uncertain about the correct procedure, I contacted SoFi's customer service for guidance. The representative was unsure about the referral bonuses applicability, but advised me to proceed. After opening the account, I was informed that the referral might not work and that they would need to submit an exception request. This is a long review. Seeking a second opinion, I reached out to another representative who suggested that I close the account and start over, a suggestion that seemed impractical jokers. In search of clarity, I escalated the issue to an account manager, hoping for resolution. However, the account manager bluntly informed me that I would not receive the referral bonus, showing no empathy for my situation. When I expressed my disappointment and considered closing the account, the manager's response was dismissive, telling me I was more than welcome to do so before hanging up. A 1 out of 5 review. Note, report them to the CFPB immediately. The CFPB is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So far, used to be great. That's how you build trust with your audience. You start with a positive. Because if you're just negative, people may dismiss the review. If you start off with a positive, you gain credibility. SoFi was great, but after almost a year of having my statement balance charged to a bank account that doesn't exist anymore in error, having the support give me multiple tickets on the issue, and now getting hung up on twice while just trying to explain the issue, talk about a run on sentence. I've been having, this is too hard to read, let's move on to the next one. A one out of five. This bank is the worst bank I ever banked with. Bank, bank, bank. I saw their ads for a higher interest rate, then open online checking account. Then I deposited a big check in it. I never saw a big check. Maybe on those game shows when you win the grand prize, a really big check. The second day I received a call, did not state who he is, who he works for, but directly asked who I was and who wrote me a check. So I thought it was a scam. So I said, I don't have to tell you, I don't know you. Then the second day, my account was frozen. That was a good check. It's a big amount, but you can see is available on my account, but I cannot use any of it. It's frozen. This one's getting exciting. So I called customer service. They provided four at least 50 times. Every time told me there's nothing they can tell me. There's no information and no higher manager or department I can talk to. What's the reason they don't know? And how will it be frozen they don't know? This is getting a little hard to read. Let's move on. Another one out of five. SoFi incorrectly processed an insurance premium refund when I switched insurance companies that I mailed to them within two business days of receiving. My escrow account has been off for over eight months. I've paid $2,000 extra throughout the year and I've wasted multiple hours on the phone with customer service, as well as online inquiring with customer service. Maybe I should stop reading verbatim. Another one out of five. All the money in my account was empty despite me calling SoFi three times as it was happening. I'm a teacher and I lost $3,000. My wife died when my daughter was three and I work with at-risk youth teaching job skills. What the hell does that have to do with banking? They said they can talk to me in five to 10 days, but that I might not get my money back. I'm not going to make it without the money. I'll drink milk for 10 days so my kid can eat real food. I don't think I'm going to make it much longer though. I don't want to. I think SoFi not doing anything about me getting robbed. I gotta make some popcorn. I'm on the edge of my seat. Look at this sentence. SoFi is not completely to blame, but it's insane that they wouldn't cancel the transaction at all. Like they let them steal the money when they could have stopped it. Meanwhile, whoever hacked or got my account got away with the money and the security won't even look at it for 10 days. Meaning, they treat criminals stealing from their customers better than they treat their customers. Maybe the government will cover it. Maybe SoFi will have to wait for a bailout. But they are quiet, literally allowing criminals to profit off of their customers and the American people's taxes. Dun dun dun. It is cool, SoFi. 10 days to address my money, be safe. I noticed someone posted upper management's info to a super magical place, enjoy. 
Yikes. Another one out of five. SoFi absolutely does not ensure your money is safe. I think they meant E-N-S-U-R-E, insure. Even when a card was used in three countries in 12 hours, they still wouldn't return money from fraudulent charges when clearing one can't be in three countries at a time. My head is spinning. Let's move on. Another one out of five. Unreliable. Years ago, I got a personal loan through that was paid in full ahead of time. I requested another loan and I was approved. I signed the documents and sent the void check. Then I was denied. The reason I was given is that they could not verify my identity and the customer agent recommended I create another SoFi account with another email. Weird dot dot dot. If you have any money in SoFi, take it out while you can. If you change or lose your current phone, there is no way for them to verify your identity via email. The company is not a scam, it's just incompetent. These are not good reviews. I opened my account a few weeks ago. I had a drunk driver crash into my home. These people have a lot of stories. Really exciting lives. I started a fundraiser to help my wife and I recover. When I tried to deposit a check, SoFi froze my account for suspicious activity. Nobody would tell me if it was suspicious. Or what gives them the right to freeze my whole account for depositing a valid check? Customer service are the last point of contact and they are all foreigners to the US. Bank elsewhere, I'm closing my account ASAP. This is the worst bank, double exclamation point. I had my debit card compromised, so I had to order a new debit card. White people problems. They said it would take seven to 10 business days to receive the card. I can't use my Apple wallet because the number is not showing up on the card and I cannot transfer money to another bank account for two to three business days. Talk to customer service told him I had no cash and needed money. They told me there was nothing they could do and I would just have to deal with it. Do not use this bank. I'm reading verbatim, just so you know, in case it sounds odd. Beware, your money is not safe with this institution. IT scammers that outsource customer service and take no responsibility or accountability. Doomed to fail. Contact your state's attorney general if you have a problem. Try to deposit some checks after closing WF account, Wells Fargo, I assume. Asked what I needed to get these through. They said that needed to write account in SoFi Mobile only. Did that, but still got rejected and froze my account. Called to get freeze off and find a resolution, but they just say that it's under internal review, providing no reason, no escalation, no time frame. They also just hung up on me. This is the beginning of the month. Bills need to be paid. They are holding my money hostage. Interest rate on savings is good but there are many other banks that are the same. Time to find another one. Here's a good review. Started my experience with SoFi with a personal loan for debt consolidation and expanded to investment and a checking account. No complaints with any of my experiences with this bank, which is not something I could say for any other bank I have worked with. Back to the one star. Run as fast as you can. There is no customer service or resolution. It is not a safe place to keep your funds and they will restrict your account when it doesn't make sense. Kind of like my review, it just doesn't make sense. No apostrophe, and doesn't. My account was hacked and I was able to stop it from going through. It took weeks for them to contact me to reopen it. During that time, I was refused the right to speak with a supervisor. After that headache, I moved funds out to close the account. Then they decided to restrict the account and make me jump through hoops without a proper cause, not worth it. SoFi Bank absolutely sucks, please run. Do not invest nor deposit your money here. Nor, look at that, fancy. This bank only uses Green Dot to deposit money. Green Dot is also an online bank, by the way. 24 hour service, that was a question. Wah ha ha ha, hash, not at all, you lion. If you're 24 hours, I'm Santa Claus and you've been naughty. That's actually pretty funny, I like that. December 23, as I got the bonus money for direct deposit, also the direct deposit that day, SoFi froze my account for my protection, in quotes. Yet, 
would not tell me why or even transfer the call to anyone else who would possibly explain the problem or approximate length of freeze. After much research, I found the common denominator of the hundreds of account holders, the same events identical as mine. If you do not qualify for their loans, credit, school loans, etc., expect the most foul customer service in a closed account. I found this bank one of the worst experiences I've ever had with a banking institution. If I could provide negative stars, I would. Oh my god, this has to be bad. Applied for a personal loan, was pre-approved, sent them required documents immediately. Now five days later, I find the application is still in review and customer support is completely clueless slash helpless as far as helping. I like that clarification, as far as helping. Additionally, every time I called in for a status, I was told a different processing time frame. Good thing this don't come to fruition. Fruition? That's one of the biggest words I've seen. I don't want to deal with this type of institution. Stay away is best advice. Best egg is very good. Best egg is also fintech. They provide loans. I don't think they're publicly traded though. Wow, I entirely regret doing business with this company. The customer service team is ignorant of internal policy and procedure. I had a check deposited, was told there would be a five day hold, only to find out it's supposed to be 60 plus days, and that's a projection. I left B of A and Wells Fargo for a bank that cannot handle a deposit. Is there a bank where they won't open unauthorized accounts incompetent? I had been a customer for four years. A few days ago, I was scammed by someone using their logo branding, and even text verification number. After that person stole my entire paycheck, I called to dispute the charge. This person is a stranger to me. They made a person-to-person -person transfer to themselves. Despite being FDIC insured and thinking I had even a basic level of fraud protection, I was told today that I'm being held responsible for this fraud. I'm so disappointed in SoFi. I chatted two times, talk two times on the phone in the last 30 days. They say on their website that welcome bonus come under 15 days. 46 days elapsed and no bonus is coming. Dishonest bank. Maybe the small bank struggle like the Silicon Bank, which made bankrupt last month. Tomorrow I close my account and move Moo Money. Moo Money is serious stuff. If he just moved money, I'd be okay, but Moo Money is a big deal. Same as some other reviews here. I got scammed by fraudulent transactions, and SoFi is telling me because they use the chip, they cannot do anything. I don't know how I can recommend a bank that cannot protect its own customers. I agree with you there. Works when it does. If it doesn't, you're on your own. I like that quote. Never received welcome bonus for opening SoFi money account or a gift card for checking loan rate. Contact a customer support multiple times and got a different answer every time, each of which specified a different offer than the one I signed up with. Try to withdraw funds from active investor account multiple times and they just schedule a transfer but it doesn't occur. Even days after the scheduled date, Unfortunately, cannot recommend them anymore for these reasons. I rarely experience something so bad that I actively find ways to vet and share. Oh, he means vent, right? But this is an exception. Their website and chatbot don't offer enough clear info about their home loan. So I called both numbers that chatbot recommended and both asked me for application or loan number, my social security number and date of birth. Is that truly necessary for general inquiry? Well, I have to agree with them there. Why do they need so much information? Oh, maybe to verify who you are and so you don't get scammed. When I called one number, the agent, ooh, the agent, so professional, just said that her department only deals with existing loans. She offered little understanding for my question and situation, but transferred me to the other number. So what do you guys think? Reading reviews, fun, no fun? Leave a comment, thanks for watching.